Doors are open. Hopefully people will show up. So far, a few. All right, hello. Give it a few more seconds and then we'll get started. All right, I think people will roll in. I'm seeing some familiar faces, or familiar names rather, not faces, um, but I'll get started. Hello, my name is Tanaz. Welcome to our second Shotgun Day replay webinar for 2019. Um, the story between this like short series of two of webinars is that we did this year at SIGGRAPH for the second time, um, like a shotgun day, which was a full day of presentations and great information about all the cool things you can do with shotgun. We had two sessions this year that were devoted to developing with shotgun. First, like an introduction to all of the different ways that you can develop a shotgun, the APIs that we have, and like... Uh, different kinds of touch points for automation. Uh, and, and today we're doing uh, advanced topics in developing with Shotgun. We have two presentations today. The first half is going to be Brandon Ashworth, uh, one of our engineers, who's going to talk about um, webhooks, which is our newest offering within the like Shotgun ecosystem, as well as our event trigger framework that we've had for a while. Um, and then Manny is going to go, Manny Orstrom, our tech lead, is going to um, talk us through a demo of writing a quick toolkit app, which we'll touch on using our APIs in addition to some of the finer points of, um, of toolkit and its app frameworks. So I think we can jump in and get started. Um, I will hand it over to Brandon Ashworth to go ahead and do that. Hi, thanks. Let me share the screen. Oh, actually, I'll jump in quickly while you're setting up. If okay. you guys have questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A box at the bottom, um, and we will answer those at the end of each of the two presentations. Um, I think that's all I need to announce. OK, all yours. Hi. Right. Well, welcome to Working with Shotgun Events. Um, I'm Brandon Ashworth. I'm a principal software engineer on the Auto or on the shotgun ecosystem team. Um, my background is from visual effects. I worked in visual effects for about eight years from starting an artist all the way up to um, software engineering lead. Um, and I've been with the Autodesk team for about two years, I think two years next week, um, working on the REST API and webhooks. Um, so what we're gonna talk about in this presentation is events in shotgun, um, what we're gonna build throughout this presentation, the event daemon, um, what it is, getting started with it, and how to build a plugin for it. And then we're going to look at webhooks, since that's our newest, going to be our newest offering. Um, what are webhooks? Porting that plugin we just wrote from the event daemon over to webhooks, um, and then other ways we can use webhooks, since there's millions of different things we can do. And then we'll have a Q and A. Um, if I see any questions during the thing that I can answer really quickly, I'll try to answer them. But I'll tr uh, we'll try to do all the questions at the end. If they're not quick. Um, yeah, so everything from this presentation is available on our GitHub, um, just the shotgun software org, and then the SG SIGGRAPH 2019 repo. Um, yeah, so shotgun events. Um, so events in shotgun, we usually think of them as the event log entry table um, that includes, that has, stores all the actions for everything that happens in a shotgun, um, anything from logins all the way to updates on assets and deletes and many other different things that we want to track like um, over time. So uh, that table's basically always going to be your biggest table in your database, but um, it has a lot of useful information. We can act on those. So I want to take a look at what an event looks like. Um, we're going to, so we're just going to look at the Python representation of one of these events. Um, it's basically just a dictionary. Um, it's just got, we've got an ID. This is your event log entry ID in the database. Um, we have a meta dictionary. This, this dictionary contains all the information about this specific event. Um, this changes based on the event type. So you'll see different fields come and go depending on what type of event you're working with. Um, so in this case, we're working with an attribute change um, type. Um, so we're gonna have the attribute name, this code in this case. We have the data type of code. It was a text field. 
um, we'll have what entity type it was, this was associated, this, this field is associated with, it was an asset, and we'll, we, can, we have the ID of that asset um, that happened on this, for this change. And then we can also see, since it was a change, we, got the, we have the new value and the old value, so we can see what changed during this event. Um, then outside of that extra information, we also have like what user made that change. So we've got our entity dictionary for um, the user. We can see it was a human user. Um, we have our, an entity dictionary for the entity. So we can see this was that asset we saw over in the meta. And we've got our project. So if it was a project, um, a project based asset, we'll have the project. If not, you won't have a project here. And then we have some other extra information like what type of operation this was. Um, it was an update. This is useful when we start talking about webhooks. Um, we have what time this event was created, so we know when this actual event happened. Um, we've got the event type. This is more specific to um, the entity type, so this actually contains the entity type name. Um, we can see it was an asset change. This is gonna be extremely useful when we start talking about the event daemon, because um, this is how we'll filter on what type of events we care about. Um, a session UUID, this is the, if this was done from the UI, you would have a session UUID here that you could pass back through the API and make cha any change you make up here uh, for that user if they're still in the same place. Um, I actually made this API request through the, rest, for the, through the Python API using a human user, so there's no session UUID in this one. Um, and then lastly, we have that attribute name again. So that's the basic structure of an event. Um, we'll talk about this more when we get to webhooks and because it'll change just slightly, but this is what you'll receive anytime you're working with an event in Shotgun. If you're querying it from the event log entries table or you're using the daemon, the event daemon, or you're, even if you're using webhooks, you'll get something very similar to this. Um, so what we're gonna build in this presentation is something from Tanaz's talk. So to, if you saw Tanaz's talk last week or at SIGGRAPH, she had this slide of Violet who's a layout supervisor um, she wants all the tasks that are to all tasks to be set to ready to start as soon as their upstream task is final without any extra steps. So no human intervention. So we're going to build that. It's not the most complicated thing, but it works <laughs> and it's easy to demo. Um, so here's what we're going to build. So I've got some tasks. We've got layout. It has a dependent task of um, anim. Anim has a dependent task of effects and light. So when we switch layout to final, anim updates to ready to start. When we switch and I'm the final effects and light will move to ready to start. Simple enough. Um, so let's start talking about how we're going to do this. So look, let's look at the shotgun event daemon first. Um, so the shotgun event daemon is an open source project from us. Um, it's written by Patrick Boucher, who works on, on the shotgun team. Um, it's a Python service that you can just run anywhere you want. Um, it's plugin based, so when you want to write an uh, event trigger for the daemon, you just write a new plugin, you set up the callbacks and everything, and you just let it run. And I will go through how you actually do that. Um, it's polling based, so it does have to talk to your shotgun site every n number of minutes so that you can get data. And it's it, what it's doing is basically it's using the event log entry table to um, query what events happened since the last ID it has stored. Um, so to get started with this, first thing you would need to do, clone the repo. So it's available on, the, on GitHub in the Shotgun Software org. Um, it's called Shotgun Events. Um, we need to configure that daemon once we have it, um, and then we need to develop our plugin. So in that repo for this presentation that I was talking about earlier, you'll see there's two project folders, one for the event daemon and one for webhooks. And so let's, let's look at the layout really quickly for what it is for uh, the event daemon. So we have a config file. This is our shotgun event daemon config. Um, it's just the example config plus some changes for, that I made. Um, we have the task status flipper plugin. Um, it's just our source code for our plugin. And then we've got, I sim linked in the source directory, which is the shotgun event source directory to make it easy for when we build our Docker container. Um, so there's a requirements.txt file to define our Python dependencies for the Docker container. We've got our Docker file for the container, and then we've got a Docker Compose to just start it all and keep it all running in the ports we want. Um, so let's start looking at our um, config for this. So the Shotgun Event Daemon config is an INI, it's an INI format. It's really simple to understand. It's very well documented. Um, so I'm just going to go over the parts I changed to make this this demo work. 
Um, it's just three little sections. They're common parts that you have to change probably for some of them you'd probably have to change if you're running something like this too. So the first section is the daemon section. Um, so I just moved the PID file into var run so that when the container starts and stops, you don't have the PID file left over. Um, the PID file is just tracking the process ID for the container. Um, if it gets removed, it will stop, or sorry, for the event daemon. Um, if the PID file gets deleted, the event daemon will shut down the next time it does its loop. Um, then the next thing is the event ID file. So this file tracks where in the event log entry table we are. So it just stores the ID of the last record we saw. Um, so if this file doesn't exist, what will happen is it will, the event daemon will start up. It will then query shotgun to say, what was the last event log entry? And then it will store it here. And the next time it does its loop, it will use that ID. Um, so I put it into this named volume, um, shotgun events, that you can see in the compose file. And basically I just put it there so that when we start and stop the container, we can maintain state. Same thing for the logs. I move them to the same named container, just so if we stop the daemon or it crashes, we can view the logs and we don't have to go through all the Docker stuff. Next section is shotgun. This is just configuring your daemon to interact with your shotgun server. So you just set the server, set your um, API key name, and set your API key. And then lastly, we just need to tell it where our plugins live. So I use that same named volume just in a plugins folder so that we can have everything there and they'll just get melted in when we run our Docker Compose or you could write a Docker uh, file that pulled it all in and stored it. So the next section is, so you wanna write a plugin. Um, so we need to just look at what, what things are required for writing a plugin for a callback and um, what, what, we, what else is uh, needed for this to automatically get picked up. So first thing, just two simple normal imports, OS and logging, nothing special there. Um, but then we get to our first required function. So for all plugins, you're required to have this function called registered callbacks and accepts one argument. Um, it's the registrar from the event daemon. And basically this function will get called automatically when the file is imported and it will register your callback with the system so that you can say, I'm subscribed to these events and I want you to run this callback with these arguments. So if we go and look at our first line here, um, so we need to set up a filter saying, okay, what events do we care about for this callback? Um, and like I said before, that event um, type that we saw in the event is very important. Um, so we say we're looking for task changes here, um, and then you could put any type of event um, you want here, and we're looking for only the column SG status list to change. Um, you could put star here and say, give me all changes for task, or you could put star on both sides and say, give me all changes, but I highly suggest making your callbacks very specific to um, what you're trying to do. That way they're much easier to bug later on. You can turn off one without disabling everything, right? Um, and then, so we need to register our callback now. Um, so we call register callback on the registrar. Um, the first two arguments are a shotgun API name and key. So this is because when your callback is called, the first argument will end up being a fully instantiated shotgun instance. It'll have the keys already set. It, if, it had, if your event had a session UUID, it'll have the UUID set um, so that all you have to do is make any shotgun calls you need to make. Um, then we need to give it our function that we're gonna call as our callback. We'll write this in a minute. Um, then we need our, our filter. So this is just saying, okay, use this filter to, call when, to find events for this to call. And the last is just arbitrary arguments that you wanna pass in to your callback. Um, we're not gonna pass anything for this case, um, but you could, if you had a function that could work on multiple different things, like multiple shows or something, and you need to set different filters um, programmatically, you could register multiple callbacks with different uh, arbitrary arguments here. And then lastly, we're just gonna set the logging level to debug, just so we can see something in the terminal later on when we run this and it just doesn't look like magic. Um, so yeah, so that's our, that's how we register our callback. So now we just need to write the callback function. Um, and it's not too complicated. Um, so first thing we have our signature for our function. It's, um, we just called it status status flipper. It takes a shotgun instance, takes a logger, a Python logger, takes our entity dictionary, and then those arbitrary args we could have defined, which we said were none. Um, and since we're only caring about, uh, tasks that their status changes to final, we just look at the meta new value um, and look for final. So we're only gonna act on those events. And then we wanna look for the downstream events from that task 
Um, so we're going to just do, do a find on task. We're going to say, give me any task that has an upstream of the event entity that we're, we got the event for. We're going to get back the status for that event, or for that, sorry, for that task. And I'll show you, you'll see why in a minute. Um, and then, yeah, so since we don't know how many tasks we're going to have here, we don't really want to make a query per task. So I'm just going to create a batch um, array, uh, sorry, a list of batch requests for it. Um, so we create, say they're update um, requests, they're on task, they're going to be for the task we're looping over at the time. We're going to set them to ready to start, their status to ready to start, and then we're just looping over each one. And then, so we wanted that status before because we're only going to update, add, a uh, add an update for anything that was in waiting to start. So we're doing this for mainly because you don't want to really want a task that's already in progress or been omitted to go to ready to start when you know it's already in its the state it should be. Um, this is also kind of important. This type of gate and this gate is really important for things like you want to make sure when you're doing these types of um, things that you don't end up um, acting on your own events so that you don't end up <laughs> having this loop that's just going to go on forever that you make a change, your script makes a change, you then get a new event and you then make a change on that event again. Um, in previous jobs, what we did is we um, actually filtered out all events from out that were made by the API key for our service. Um, but yeah, and then lastly, um, we just want to execute all those batch updates. So there we go. And then, so now we can see this running. We've got our plugin. We just need to start up our daemon with the plugin and run it. So we've got our tasks again. We've got, I've got the Docker Compose set up, ready to run down here. We start everything. Um, you can see that it didn't have an ID, so it had to pull out the new um, ID. And then it'll check again in a second. There we go. Saw there was a change, made the change to the system. And then it'll see the update again, and you'll see more, more um, events come through the system. So in what, under 100 lines of code, we made a quick little ta uh, task status flipper um, that will go through and change our um, any task that was finaled or any of the downstream tasks for finaled tasks to ready to start so that a coordinator or anyone doesn't have to manage that. It just automatically happens. Um, so that that's the event, Damon. It's been out, out for a while. We've had it for years upon years now. Um, it works really well and it's used in a lot of productions. And as you saw, it was fairly easy to just get set up and running. Um, but we've been started on, a, we've been working on a new project related to events also for webhooks. So webhooks um, will just be the next generation kind of this. They're, they each have their own use cases that we can talk about later if you want. But um, yeah, so I guess let's talk about webhooks a bit. So what are webhooks? Um, so Jeff Lindsay, who came up with the term a long time ago, um, called them an architectural pattern for web developers to provide user-defined callbacks over HTTP for their applications. Um, so what does that mean for us? It basically means we're going to allow you to subscribe to certain types of events, and you can then have us send a HTTP request to a service that you define. Um, and you'll get some information about what happened. Um, so if we look at that flow inside a shotgun, um, so a change happens or something's created, but we could generate an event. Um, that event's put into the system. We then process that event. We determine if it's relevant to any webhook you've set up. Um, if it is, we're going to dispatch that out to all relevant webhooks over an HTTP post request. Um, and then it's just your job to consume that request and tell us whether or not you got it or it failed um, and send data back to us related to that. So yeah, simple flow. It's just we're, you, don't, you don't have to run a service that's polling anymore. We're just going to push stuff to you. Um, so before we get too far into this, we need to look at some terminology really quickly. Um, just two terms. One we've already seen, event. Um, we're, this still just means the information stored in, about an action in Shotgun. Um, and it still means that in this system. But when I refer to it when talking to web hosts, normally I'm specifically referring to it uh, related to Shotgun. Um, and then we have deliveries, and deliveries are encapsulations of events, um, but it's the when they're going through webhooks, we start calling them deliveries. So we'll see later on that a how a delivery dif uh, data structure slightly differs from the event data structure we saw before, but it's so slight that it's not a huge deal. And you'll see when we build our, we port our plugin, that it's 
there's no major changes to be or needed to be made. Um, so let's talk about the features that webhooks will launch with. Um, so we'll allow subscriptions to entity creates, deletes, updates. And all of these can be per project. Um, so you can say, I only care about updates on one project, or I, you have two different webhooks for different projects for updates or whatever you need to do. Um, Redeliveries, you'll be able to resend any delivery you need to. If it maybe it failed and you want to resend it through the pipe, your pipeline, or maybe you just are testing a new webhook and you want to just resend the same data over and over and over till you get your webhook working perfectly. Um, and acknowledgements, we'll go into more detail about a bit later, but basically it's a way to give some metadata about how, um, a, how a delivery was handled in kind of an asynchronous way. Um, signed request. You can um, give us a token for your webhook, and we will sign the request for it um, as it goes through the system, as it's before it's sent to you. And then you can use that to validate that the request coming into your service is from us. SSL validation. Um, this is more we allow a dis disabling SSL validation if you need to. So if you have a certificate that you know we don't have the uh, CA for, um, you can just disable SSL validation. Maybe you're doing testing with a self signed search or something like that. Um, and then all of this is controllable via the REST API. So anything you want to do programmatically, we have a, we'll have a REST API for it um, that you can use. And then we'll also have the web UI. So let's talk about things we need to think about when writing a webhook. So the biggest thing is error and, errors and uh, webhook deactivation. So if a webhook fails 100 or more times within a 24-hour period, we will deactivate the webhook. Um, and this is just because. We want to keep. We want to dispatch information to stable webhooks. Um, we can't have people having like thirty-second timeouts and things like that. So, and we'll talk about timeouts in a minute. But basically, this is any timeouts, um, network failures, status codes greater than four hundred, greater than or equal to four hundred. So, be careful about what status codes you send. Also, run your responses. Um, but yeah, this is just for mainly stability of the whole system. Uh, Response time, so yeah, as I said, timeouts are one of the failures. So you have six seconds to respond um, to a webhook request. Um, after the six seconds, we will just mark it as failed um, and move to the next um, delivery that we need to send for, your, for yours or someone else's um, queue. Uh, yeah, and so one thing to note about all this first um, is that if, if you do have a webhook that gets marked as failed, you can just restart it. Um, we allow you to disable it and re-enable it, and we'll clear the 24-hour queue for you, so the 24-hour count, so you'll start again at zero. Um, just because we know failures do happen, network outages happen, uh, and everything like that. So uh, because of the six seconds, we know that's not a long time, so that's where acknowledgments comes in. So for webhooks that take longer than the timeout, you can um, just respond to us that you successfully received it and then do your work asynchronously and then when you're done you'll have the delivery ID for that delivery so you can um, update the acknowledgments field on the delivery that way if you need to you just want to track status of a, a lot of your asynchronous tasks you can just go in and see that in the web UI or even pull the data from the rest API so I said before that the data structure changed a bit so um, it's still fairly similar, so, but the biggest change is everything now lives, or the event now lives under a data key. Um, if you've used our REST API, you've probably seen this a lot. We want, everything's nested under a data key. Um, and then the next big change really is that the ID for that um, event is now an ID that's kind of an internal tracking ID through our system, but you still have your event log ID. It's just moved to an event log entry ID field. Everything else is actually the same um, inside the data uh, object. So everything's standard. Um, and then there's just one more key outside. Uh, there's a timestamp now um, to show when we uh, signed the request. So if you get a signature, you'll also have a timestamp. And this is for security reasons. Um, yeah, so that's, there's, as you see here, like, yeah, if you're not using ID, you really just need to make sure you pull one, from one layer lower and you can still do this, use the same code. And we will see that in a minute. Um, so let's port that plugin that we wrote before over to webhooks. It's, we're just gonna use Python because the other, the daemon used Python also. It's also really simple. Um, we're gonna use Flask, it's a great little uh, web service framework. 
And then we're gonna use the shotgun API since we're using Python and we've already got some code that uses the shotgun API. Let's just continue using it. So the project layout for this one, um, we have an app.py now, which is just our Python code for the Flask app. And then everything else is basically, this, they're just different versions of the same stuff. Um, we have a requirements.txt with just our new dependency of Flask. We've got our Docker file that just describes a slightly different container. And we've got our compose file that just um, spins up our container and opens up a port for us. Um, so we start writing our uh, webhook service now. Um, so our just uh, some setup stuff. So we got our OS and logging again. Um, we need to import Flask this time. So we get our Flask um, class, we get our request object and our make response method. Um, we grab the shotgun API because we actually have to manage the shotgun API now instead of having the event daemon manage it for us. Um, so we make our instance of our Flask API or Flask app, um, our shotgun instance. Um, I'm just using some environment variables to get all the configuration information. Um, just best practices when using Docker containers. And yeah, so there's our just basic setup stuff. We have every, we just have our app we can use for making our service. We have our shotgun instance. Um, we've got some stuff we need for our handler. So let's start looking at writing our handler. So first thing we need to do is define our route. Um, it's gonna be task status or slash task status. Um, and we're only gonna allow the post method. I highly suggest anything you write for webhooks only allow the post method. Um, we're never gonna send you anything else or any other HTTP method. Um, so there's no point to open yourself up to any sort of security stuff. Um, just only allow that. Um, and then we need to find our handler function. I like to name my handler functions similar to my route, um, mainly because I program in a lot of other languages where this isn't this close together. Um, we're gonna do some error handling this time. Um, we need to parse our request to get our JSON or to get our data object uh, for the re int, for the event because that will be the post body. Um, we need to pull our event out of the data, so we're just grabbing what's in the data key. Um, we're going to set the session UUID with whatever was in the event. You definitely should have some error handling here. For the sake of the slide, I removed all error handling in this code. Um, we're going to run a, a process task status event um, uh, function on that event. And this is going to do our. This is going to be our mo most of our logic for this um, system, and the code will look very sim very familiar to you. Hopefully, um, we're going to catch all exceptions. And the reason we're doing this in this case is just we want to say if if there was any exception for any reason, let's just look, set the mess the, the response body to the message of the exception and call it a five hundred. This way, when we respond to the webhook service, uh, we can see that this failed for some reason and you can kind of get an idea. And we'll see an example of this later on. And then if all went well, let's just we're just gonna respond with okay. Um, and since we don't set the status and using make response, it just by default sets the status to 200. And then now we need to actually write our code that will handle um, processing that event. So we have our function process status event, um, task status event and takes the event. And this code should look very familiar to you because it's literally copy and pasted from the other one. And I did that because I wanted to show that if you're not using things like ID and, and you, if you do already do the pre-processing of getting your event out, you can easily share code between an old event daemon plugin and a new web a webhook um, service. Um, here we're just not, we don't use anything that's changed. Everything works well. We're just doing the same logic. And therefore we can easily just run this thing for us. Um, so we've re written our service now. We have it, we can run it. It'll accept post requests. It'll process that event. It'll uh, return errors if there are errors, return okay if it's okay. Um, and it'll update our statuses. So now we need to actually register that with Shotgun. So let's go in and create a webhook. So this is the new webhook UI for um, the admin webhook UI for Shotgun. Um, I'm gonna create a webhook here. Just gonna give it a name. Um, I'm not gonna give a description because I kind of knew what it was, um, but we're gonna give it a URL. I had ngrok running so I could point to my uh, Flask service. I'm gonna give it a secret token, but I'm not gonna use it. Um, leave validation, I'm gonna leave validation on um, since it's HTTP and not HTTPS. Um, and then we're gonna set, we're gonna, I'm just gonna pause this for a second. 
sorry. Um, let me just fast forward a bit. Um, but we're going to set the project to, we're going to filter on the project. Um, then we're going to filter on tasks and our task changes and then status change, the status column. So we'll get our webhook here. You can see it's set to active. We've got no deliveries so far. We can disable it if we want. We can delete it. Um, it shows you what projects it's filtered for. It shows you what, the what events will trigger it. Um, if there's no secret token, this will just be blank, but you will never see the value of secret token ever again. So if you set a secret token, I suggest putting it somewhere safe. Um, and then here you'll see all, all the deliveries and we'll see that later on. Um, and you'll be able to filter and re-deliver things. Uh, testing, so let's test our webhook now. So this should look really familiar. It looks just like our last test. Uh, only difference is now we're running um, a different uh, service. So same dependencies, layout, ha anim has layout, um, effects and light have anim. So we start that up, start our service down there at the bottom. Um, it'll get the event in a second. And there we go, we got the post. So we made the change and it already received the next event for the change to anim. And then I'll change anim and you'll see that it, this receives the last three events. So yeah, we quickly ported that plugin from our um, event daemon over to a flat, making it a flask app in just, this, just a little bit of code and a little bit of time. And there was no major change, overhaul to the structure of our code. It was just kind of wrapping what we already had. Um, so let's look at what this looks like in the admin UI now. Um, so now we have our five, we have five deliveries happened. You can see two deliveries were caused by events by me and three deliveries were caused by events that came from changing the status in the webhook service. Um, so let's take a deeper dive into these, but you can, but we'll take a deeper dive into this bottom one in a second, but you can also see you have checkboxes here and this will allow you to select them and re-deliver them. So if we wanted to re-deliver this one, because maybe this actually, let's say this actually failed, we could actually just re-deliver it. Um, so if we dive down into that bottom one, you'll see we have a section for request and response, and we can look at what each of those have now. So for a request, you have um, our headers here. We've got our two standard headers, except in content type. Then we've got um, some shotgun headers. Uh, we've got a signature. This is the signature for this request that we use sign with that sign, that token we set earlier. Um, we've got our webhook ID. So if you're running multiple uh, webhooks into one service. This will let you identify which webhook that was um, if you need to do special logic based on that. Um, we've got event batch, uh, ID, size, and index. Um, these are some tracking information for um, how we pass them through our system internally, but they're actually, it's really useful for if you just accept a lot of events really quickly from multiple services at once, um, you could then like then order them and figure out what order it was to process them in some asynchronous process if you needed to. And then like um, the webhook ID, you also have the site URL just in case you're running multiple sites on the same service. So if you're running dev and staging on one service and then prod on another, on dev and staging, you could figure out which site you needed to make the updates to based on this header. Um, what header that is missing from here because it wasn't available when I did the slide was the delivery ID. There will also be a delivery ID header um, so that you can use that when doing acknowledgements. Um, the next thing is the payload should look very similar um, to what we saw earlier, just the keys are in a different order. But yeah, we just have our data key with our event and we have our event log entry down here and we have our other ID there and then we have our, all, all our standard stuff. Um, if we look at the response side, we've got just whatever headers that Flask was setting. So date, server, content type, content length. Um, and then we've got our body of okay. And you can see we've got this nice little green bar here to indicate that the status the status code that was returned um, meant it got marked as a um, successful request. Um, one thing to note is down here at the bottom, you'll see there's a note <laughs> um, saying delivery logs will automatically be removed from the system after five days. So yeah, we keep five days worth of data that you can search and then you can re-deliver anything in that five day period. And then after five days, we'll drop the, on the sixth day, we'll drop the oldest day. So you'll lose an entire day at once but you'll still have the current five, the, the last four days plus the current day. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to show what it looks like if you have a failure. So the bar, the status bar goes red. Um, you can see my message here from the exception. And then the webhook got marked as unstable. And unstable basically means anywhere between one and 99 
failures over the last 24 hours. Um, once you hit that 100th one, this will be marked as failed and you'll have to disable and re-enable it to start it up again. Um, and yeah, there's a disabled field here also that will be, a, it's gray so that you know what ones are disabled. Um, so yeah, so that was, that's basically all you have to do to write a webhook um, service. Uh, just accept a post request, process some data, do whatever you need to do. Um, but I want to talk about some other ways you can use webhooks also, because I mean, since it's an HTTP request, you don't have to worry about languages really. You don't have to worry about um, any other tech you want to use, but it also means you can use other tools, right? So there's a class of tools that I love on the internet, which I call web automation tools. Um, so it's the things like if this, then that, and Zapier. Um, so what we're, I'm just gonna show you a quick video I made um, of making, updating a Google spreadsheet with every shot status update um, based on a webhook. So we'll play that. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna create a, a new Zap. It's just got a shot status. It's just gonna be called shot status change. Um, it's gonna use the trigger webhook. Um, I'm gonna say catch all post requests. It's gonna give me a URL. I'm gonna go in and create a webhook in my site. Just give it a name. Um, it, it was late. I was, I, my typing skills went downhill. <laughs> um, so we post that. Uh, not going to give a token because it can't use the token. Uh, it was a different server, so I'd use Bigfoot Bunny on this server. Um, and just say look for shot events and when they're where their status changes. So we'll create that. And so Zapier is going to now ask us to send some sample data. So I'll tell it I created the webhook and then go back to shotgun. I'm just gonna make a quick change to the status of a shot so that we can see a change come in and have some data to test with. It'll get it in a second, there we go. Um, it does munge all the names you'll see. So we have double underscores for every level now, but the, everything's still there. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to add another step. So I'm gonna look for the Google Sheets step. Um, I've already got my Google account set up, so we're just gonna say create a, a spreadsheet row and then we're gonna connect it to the spreadsheet I was using. So it's in my drive, it's, a, it's called shot status list, or it's called shot statuses. And then I'm just gonna tell it to use sheet one. Um, and then it's gonna pick up the columns automatically that existed. So if we look at the, this, we have a shot column, a status column, and a date column. And then we're just gonna connect some data to those columns. So the first thing is shot, we're just gonna use the entity ID because we don't have the shot code. Um, for status, we're just going to use the new value so we know what it was changed to, and then date, we're gonna use created at. Um, so this is gonna show us a preview of what it would have used for based on that uh, test data. And then we can actually just test it by sending it straight to Google. And by the time I clicked it, it was already there. Um, so yeah, I finish it, turned on, and then I'm just gonna go through and change the status on a few different um, shots to see the data go over there. So, We'll see this, and I just I, I ended up just checking really quickly to make sure the deliveries were there and see what the response from Zapier was. So yeah, and it's already in the spreadsheet. So yeah, I'm just gonna flip a few more and we'll see them appear in the spreadsheet within a few seconds. Um, by the time I get over there, they're almost all done. One just appears and right now, there we go. And so yeah, that is just a quick little demo of like using Zapier to, to like figure out uh, or to push some data through the system and then put it into another web service without actually coding anything. But using the shot ID isn't always nice because now you have to go figure out what 925 is. So there, Zapier does allow you to have a run a Python action. So I just played around with it for a minute. You can set the input data. So um, I gave it a variable called shot ID. Um, it was pointing at the entity ID. I accidentally cleared the, te the test data while before taking the screenshot. Um, and then I just wrote some Python code using the REST API. So you can't you install your own Python modules with this, but it does ship with request, Python requests. So luckily there's the, Python, the REST API, so we can use that. Um, so yeah, just set up a request, made, made a access token request, got my access token, um, set up my header, then made a shot request out to, uh, a, shot, a request for the shot, that specific shot out to the REST API. And then what you do is you just set the, uh, an output variable to a dictionary and that whatever data is in that output can be used in the next action. So I just decoded all the data. So we had access to tons of things like this. Any column that was on shot, we had access to in this next thing. So I could have used the code, I could have used, put any data wherever we wanted really. Um, 
but yeah. So yeah, so that's another way you can use webhooks um, and stuff. Uh, there's some cool things with Zapier. I think you could people could do like making it has digest systems, so you can make a daily digest of all shots that finaled or all versions that were finaled or anything that needed change got marked as needs changes um, and just have those sent out automatically, um, minimizing what coordinators have to do by hand currently. Um, so yeah, so webhooks is going into beta soon. Um, if you want to join the beta, you can email us at webhooks-beta at Shotgun Software. Um, we'll add you to the list and let you know um, when uh, it's available. So yeah, any questions? We don't have any questions in the Q&A, but does anyone have any that they want to add now? Anything? No? Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, wait, yeah. there's one. Oh. Do webhook requests get all fields? Do they get link fields? Webhook requests only get the data that are, is in the event. So if you need to get extra fields or linked fields, you're gonna have to make an API request out for that. Awesome. Cool, and then yeah, just check out our new community forums if you <laughs> if you have time um yeah, and yeah i'll hand it over to manny now awesome thanks brandon uh let me share my screen and start my presentation cool so um the second uh portion of this webinar will be about uh, developing a shotgun tool that runs in multiple artist apps. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the tech lead on the shotgun integration platform team. Uh, I've been doing pipelines and tools for VFX uh, feature animation and games for the past 17 years. And uh, uh, I'll be doing this session with you guys today. Uh, so quick note before we begin, all the code uh, I'll be showing, uh, just like Brandon, all of this stuff, uh, as well as the presentation, uh, is in GitHub, so you can use this as a starting point for your work, or like a tutorial if you want to dive in and try things uh, for yourself. So this session is about Shotgun Toolkit, and uh, Shotgun has a whole bunch of different sort of tech and integration points technologies. We've mentioned a few uh, already, so it can be confusing sometimes. We have the Python API, which is basically like a generic way to read and write shotgun data. It's kind of accessing the shotgun database using Python. We have the REST API, which is essentially a mirror uh, implementation of the Python API, except it's REST, so it's language agnostic. You can uh, use it for JavaScript, C++, Zapier, <laughs> uh, and it can be really handy. Then we have all the webhook stuff that Brandon just talked about, so essentially, and the event daemon, of course, that can be used essentially to react to things that happen inside of Shotgun. And then we have a Toolkit. And Toolkit is basically the platform that lets you uh, rapidly develop tools and user experiences that run inside of artist applications like Maya and Yuke Houdini. So it's a system that lets you quickly build UIs, panels, uh, other things. Um, and it's using Python and Qt. Uh, so it's got a series of API frameworks of reusable functionality to really accelerate development and build consistent user experiences. So it helps streamline things like authentication, uh, folder structure management, uh, where to store files on, on disk, all these sort of common things that a lot of tools uh, all need. Uh, and we use Toolkit uh, to write all our Shotgun in-application integrations. So if you've used things like our publisher or our loader inside of Maya Nuke, you've already used Toolkit. And one of the great things about Toolkit is that once you've written a tool for, say, Maya, it's really easy to get it to run in uh, the whole suite of applications that uh, we support as part of this platform. So uh, for the next half an hour or so, uh, we'll be learning about uh, this stuff, how to develop a toolkit app and how to deploy it into production. So uh, like Brandon, uh, we have a little sample application we'll be working on today. Uh, and hopefully this should give you some sort of idea of the complexity involved here and, and some appetite into kind of tinkering further with this stuff. Um, so we are gonna be writing the TK multi bug reporter. So uh, 
let's uh, take a look at the sort of the final result of this. So we're in Maya uh, on the shotgun menu. We can go and go to the report bugs um, uh, on the menu. Uh, I, if I have a problem, I can now directly target support. I can say, I can't find a teapot primitive in Maya. Uh, I already have some people pre-assigned, but I can add uh, the support person. Uh, why isn't there a teapot in Maya? I would, uh, I would use 3D Studio Max, but I'm not on Windows, so I can't. Uh, this sphere just isn't cool enough. Help. And I can take a screenshot of the, um, of the shelf there to sort of really indicate where is it and submit a ticket to Shotgun. And this then goes to support person who gets an email notification through Shotgun standard system. He can jump to Shotgun, he can see the thread, uh, the ticket entity, and he can say, grab it, assign himself, set it to in progress. And he's got the screenshot there. He replies, I got this, don't panic. And basically that will then generate a notification that goes back to the user. And this is like the beginnings of a kind of a, an in-studio simple support system. That's what we're gonna be building. So uh, first, we're gonna be looking at what an app is exactly. Uh, then we're gonna be looking at uh, frameworks, which is a sort of set of reusable functionality that accelerates development. And after that quick bit of theory, we're gonna jump in and start by setting up our development environment so that we can develop, and develop safely uh, without disrupting production. Uh, we're gonna be writing the actual uh, app code and then finally, we'll be deploying it to production. So uh, let's jump in. Uh, let's start with a really quick intro. What is a toolkit app? So a toolkit app is uh, basically a collection of files, a bundle. A bundle. Typically, this uh, would be a, like a GitHub repo. That's how we store all our toolkit apps. They're all available in GitHub, by the way. You can go check them out, including the source code. Um, uh, and this one is called TK Multi Bug Reporter. Uh, the naming convention here is that uh, TK is for toolkit. Multi essentially identifies that this can be run in more than one uh, software. So if it was something for Nuke, it would be TK Nuke Bug, multi, bug Reporter. Uh, so this is a simple kind of naming convention to quickly identify what it is. There are some uh, key files in here that every app will need to include. So there is an app.py. This is essentially like the public interface uh, for, the, uh, for the app. Uh, uh, the entry point that the toolkit system will, uh, be, uh, will be using uh, as you register the app, it will fulfill uh, the sort of interface contract that all apps will have to have. Uh, this is where you register things like menu actions, etc. cetera. Um, there is an info YAML file, which is essentially the configuration or the manifest for the app that describes what it is, how it's working, uh, any configuration parameters that you need. Then there's a Python folder, which has uh, the payload, the business logic. This is where you will be writing most of the code. And then you can see there's a resources section where you can put stuff like thumbnails, images, etc., and a few other bits. So let's take a look at the app.py and the info YAML really quickly. So this stuff is uh, quite straightforward. This is the, the minimum kind of boilerplate of what this looks like. You have an application base class that you derive from uh, from uh, the shotgun toolkit. And then we subclass here, so we create our own bug reporter class. And we then have an init app method that uh, the toolkit platform will call as it's registering the app and starting things up. And here we do a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, the, the last line there, register command, that's essentially registering like a menu entry uh, into the system so that we can actually access it on, the, on that shotgun menu in Maya. Uh, there's additional things you can implement here that you can control the shutdown. If you want to have an API as part of your toolkit app, you can add it in here and then you can kind of have an official API. This is, this is where you would go and access all the functionality uh, of your app. Um, and the info YAML uh, configuration manifest uh, is essentially a bunch of metadata that describes what the app is to the system. Uh, the most important part of this is the configuration where you can set up all the different parameters that you need to define. And when you then plug in the app into your configuration, you can then control its behavior. So we have one parameter that we've added to our bug reporter app, which is the CC parameter. So here you can predefine uh, a list of users, shotgun users that should be CC by default. And this can be useful if you have 
different support people uh, as part of different teams. And so when you, when you add the app to the configuration, you can drive, uh, you can configure it differently depending on, say, for example, what type of task someone is working on in Shotgun. So maybe people working on rigging tasks may have one support person that's CC by default. People who are working on looked up or animation will have a different person. Uh, you don't want to hard code those names into the app itself. You can add it as a piece of the configuration. And then there's things like uh, the name, description, and then there's also dependencies that you can register. And this takes us to the frameworks, which are these libraries of reusable functionality. So we can say that we have a dependency here on the Qt widgets framework, which lets us reuse a bunch of standard widgets. So we declare this in the uh, info.yaml file. So frameworks, they uh, play this through key part in Shotgun Toolkit because uh, we want to avoid uh, rewriting stuff and we want to help create a consistent user experience across different applications. Uh, and the best way to uh, explore what we provide, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff out of the box. There's things like widgets, so kind of, you know, uh, visual things. There's also uh, utilities and data management, uh, caching systems, asynchronous uh, data retrieval, systems, uh, there's a variety of different things. And we have a demo app, uh, Shotgun Toolkit Demos, that lets you interactively kind of explore a whole bunch of this stuff. Uh, and so this is a really good starting point if you want to see what different things exist and uh, uh, how that code looks. So you can go in and look at, say, uh, the Qt with this framework here. You can look at a particular thing. You can play with it and see what it's doing. And you can jump over to the code uh, and you can just see what what code uh, do you need to write. And you can sort of copy and paste that code into your, your own um, uh, app that you're building. Uh, so it sort of provides a really good starting point for tinkering, experimentation, and, and learning about uh, all, all the different things that are available in a pretty interactive way. And uh, there is also extensive API documentation so uh, over on the developer site, you can actually go in and dive into the details, uh, the uh, uh, API references, et cetera, and all uh, the source code for all the frameworks is available in GitHub if you really want to dive in and take a look at how things are implemented. Um, so that's the end of the theory section. Uh, let's dive in uh, and set up our development environment. So I'm kind of assuming here that you already have a project in Shotgun where you have set up toolkit uh, using our project setup wizard uh, using uh, and with our advanced integration. Uh, so here's Shotgun desktop and we have our project configured. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to start by creating a kind of a hello world app and get that into, uh, get that into our configuration. So we're going to start by creating a dev sandbox. So this is essentially taking a copy of the configuration uh, that runs in production uh, and create a private dev sandbox where we can start, you know, making adjustments to that. Uh, we don't want to do that in production because that's um, not good practice and it might break uh, things for people. So we want to do that separately in a way which is completely non-destructive. And then we're going to grab a, a starter app from GitHub uh, which is the sort of hello world placeholder app that we have, we provide. And we're then going to add that into the uh, dev sandbox configuration so that we have all the pieces we need to then actually do the development work. And uh, can do this by going into Shotgun Desktop. And you can go to the menu there and create a new config sandbox. And we can name it something, uh, my dev. And we then choose a uh, folder on disk where we want this to uh, reside. So I'm, I have like a development folder and I'm just adding it in that development folder. We took it will copy the production configuration into that folder. And now in Shotgun Desktop, you see you have uh, my dev option there on the configuration menu and I can switch. So now you see there is a kind of a blue banner. It says my dev. So now I'm actually in my development configuration, not in the production configuration anymore. So now what I'm seeing here in Shotgun Desktop reflects that configuration that I have in my dev folder on disk, not the thing that everyone else is using, which means I can go in and make changes and edit that. And I want to add my new bug reporter app. 
So uh, we have our dev sandbox folder there on disk where the configuration is inside. I'm going to create a TK multi bug reporter folder right next to it. And next step, I'm going to jump to GitHub. And we have a TK multi starter app uh, that uh, I'm going to grab. I'm just going to download the zip file uh, straight from master. And I'm going to essentially take that zip and unpack that into my uh, TK multi bug reporter folder that I just created. So now we have a kind of hello world app on disk. We have our configuration. And the next step is we need to add the app into our configuration so that it actually is registered with toolkit and so that it shows up on the menu in Maya. And I can now jump in to my uh, dev sandbox directly from Shotgun Desktop. I can go into the TK Maya YAML file where we define the configuration for Maya. Open that up in my favorite editor. I can drill down to the project level here. And you can see you have a list of apps that have been defined already. And I'm going to add my TK multi bug reporter. And I need to specify for toolkit where this app is, where is it going to go look for it. And I'm using this location uh, uh, concept. And there are different types of locations. And I'm going to use the dev type, which means that it's going to point straight to my folder on disk. And it's going to read it right from disk. And uh, for more information about how to edit your configuration and how all this stuff sort of ties together, we have some great sessions we did last year at SIGGRAPH at the Dev Day uh, around config management. And they're all on YouTube. So uh, please check them out if you have questions about this, this structure and how that works. And uh, now I can launch my app. And hopefully, uh, the uh, uh, starter app should now appear in the menu. So on the shotgun menu, I have the show starter template app. And if I click that, I see this window popping up. This is my very, very basic uh, app that is essentially just showing a little placeholder image and current context. So I'm good to go. And we can actually start developing the actual flesh out the actual app that we're going to build. So let's look quickly at the anatomy of the star trap. So the, the star trap gives you a really basic uh, uh, UI file that can be used with Qt designer. Uh, so you can go in and kind of just visually edit the UI. And it comes with a bunch of uh, uh, the, all the app.py file info YAML manifest. And it has a dialog.py file that we're looking at here, which is essentially all of the payload. This is, a, this is where everything happens, where it's creating that little simple UI. It's all Qt and Python. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to be working on today. Uh, we're not going to be going into detail about how to use Qt Designer. You don't have to if you don't need to. Uh, if you want to do a kind of code-based layout, that's fine too. We find it's a, a pretty fast workflow. You can just essentially quickly drag and drop a bunch of items in Designer, and you kind of visually create your UI. It's really good for prototyping, if nothing else. For sometimes for co more complex widgets and stuff, it's great to have more of a kind of a code-based approach. Uh, and Qt Designer is bundled with Shotgun Desktop. So if you look uh, in the install location for Shotgun Desktop, you will find all the pieces that you need to do this work. You don't need to install any additional software. And uh, naming the widgets um, uh, in a kind of a consistent, readable way is really important, uh, as, is, as it makes the code way more readable. So uh, it's great if you can have code uh, like this. If uh, self.ui screen grab .click connect to the screen grab uh, uh, screen grab method. This makes it uh, pretty easy to read, and it sort of ties it back to the to UI and the layout. If you just call them button one, button two, button three, it quickly becomes unreadable. So we highly recommend that. And once once you've designed your basic UI, uh, you we have a script build resources.sh uh, that is in the resources folder of the starter app. So you can see there is a dialog.ui. That is the user interface. And when I run the build resources of SH, it essentially creates the uh, uh, actual Python files that represent the, the UI. And that's all landing inside of that UI folder, uh, inside of the Python, inside of the app. 
so every time you make a change uh, in Qt Designer, you need to just rerun this build resources script and create the, the necessary Python stuff. It's pretty quick and straightforward. Um, and for our UI that we're setting up here, we're going to be using two different uh, 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 widgets out of our Qt widgets framework. So the first one will be this, and we saw this a little bit in the demo at the right at the beginning, uh, this CC field, which is a shotgun, uh, uh, shotgun field. So it's picking up a shotgun field widget, and we can configure it to say, you should just display a list of users. And it will auto-complete, uh, and it will provide a little icon uh, of the user entity type. And essentially, it looks like uh, one of those fields that you have in the spreadsheet uh, in the shotgun web app. And uh, the second widget is the screenshot widget. So we can just map uh, a screenshot functionality to that button so that we can just do a quick screen grab. We don't want to write that code for this app. We want to just have that as a reusable uh, piece. So the first thing we need to do is to add uh, the Qt widgets framework to the info YAML manifest to tell the app that we're going to need this framework. And that's done under that section. Um, and there is a, a major minor version uh, uh, thing happening there. So we just specify version 2.x.x, which means it sort of just tracks, um, it tracks against that particular version. Um, and you can specify a minimum version as well if you're relying on functionality that was introduced in a particular version of the, the framework. Um, and if we jump then to dialog.py, which is the main, uh, the main file and really the only file we'll be uh, editing, we need to add some imports here. So we're going to be importing the screen grab and the shotgun fields uh, module uh, out of those. And we're using an, a special import framework command. And this helps to get track the dependencies and memory management and reloading of things. And then we can use them in our code. The other thing we need to change is the uh, uh, little show dialog, which pops up the window. We're just changing the uh, starter app uh, title to be report bugs instead. And uh, that's the kind of the top section of that dialog.py uh, file. Uh, the rest is all in this app dialog class that we have in the, uh, in the starter app in the dialog.py. And uh, this is just a Qt widget standard thing. And uh, we're going to be uh, implementing four different methods here. So we're going to go through each uh, one by one. And so there's the constructor. There's a get shotgun fields, which will run at startup and populate that CC list uh, in the shotgun fields widget with data from shotgun. So we'll just get that Josh Tomlinson name in by default. We have the screen grab that implements the screen grabbing logic. And then we have create ticket, which is the kind of the, the main business logic of the app, which uh, creates a new ticket entity in shotgun, uploads the screenshot uh, if you have taken a screenshot. So let's dive in. Uh, for the constructor, most of this stuff is already provided uh, by the starter app. Uh, but, uh, and you can see uh, we have this sort of standard boilerplate where we're setting up the UI. So we're just pulling in that UI that was auto generated by uh, uh, Qt Designer. And we then uh, have to bind some of the UI. So we can go self.ui, self .ui, and then uh, we have the accepted, reject rejected. Uh, uh, we can bind those signals to a create ticket uh, slot. So when you click submit, you just go to that create, you would just run that create method. Um, and uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to initialize this shotgun field manager that handles uh, the uh, uh, CC field. So uh, this will require a little bit of explanation. So let's dive in and look at that specifically. And essentially, we're running uh, in initialize call right at the end. So we're, we're creating a new field manager. Uh, this is all pretty easy to follow if you go to the reference documentation. Uh, we're creating a new field manager, uh, and we then run initialize. And when we do that, it will do a bunch of stuff with Shotgun. It will, for example, cache the Shotgun schema to make sure it can show icons and lots of things under the hood. And we have a callback uh, uh, slot that we can call. So uh, initialized, 
So when uh, it has initialized, it will call our get shotgun fields method. So when this system is all up and running, we want to go in and we're going to pull down those users that we want to be the default users to show up in the list. And that happens in get shotgun fields uh, here. So let's take a look. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. And you can see we're using the shotgun API here, the find method to grab uh, the user IDs from shotgun. So we're grabbing, in the first line, we have the get setting. This pulls in the configuration setting. So uh, the username that you put into your configuration gets resolved using a shotgun API find command into a shotgun entity uh, link that we then can plug in to the widget later. And here you can see we're just doing app.shotgun. So uh, this is the Shotgun API, the Shotgun Python API. This is just um, a really simple, convenient way of uh, accessing the API. The Toolkit platform will take care of authentication and all these other things that you normally would have to write if you have a standalone app. Uh, it sort of handles that for you. And uh, we then create a widget. Um, and we then can set the value to be that uses uh, value that we grab from Shotgun, and we then add it to our layout. The next method is the screen grab. This is pretty simple. We just use the screen grabber, uh, uh, screen capture method that comes with uh, the screen grabbing uh, framework, uh, and that just prompts you, the user, to take a screenshot, and then we can get a QT, a QPix map back. We then set like a little preview. Uh, in the UI so that you can see the pix map. But this is very uh, straightforward, couple of lines of code and you have screen grabbing going. And uh, at this point, let's have a little look. Let's, the test is out. So, uh, let's see if I can get this video to run. Here we go. Uh, so I can go to my bug reporter app. Hey, it's working. I've got Josh in there. But when I click take a screenshot, it doesn't work. OK, what's going on? Let's go to the code and check. Ah, I realize I have not uh, connected that button up. So I need to go uh, screen grab, dot clicked, connect that to my screen grab method. And problem identified and solved. And what I can do now is I can go reload and restart in Maya. And then I can just run my bug reporter again. And now that I try a second time, you can see that I have my screenshotting working. And uh, this uh, highlights a kind of iterative workflow that you can do with Toolkit. And it's like really the way we recommend that you, you work on these things. You can quickly prototype out stuff, write a bit of code, try it out in the DCC, and then essentially just reload the code, check again and again. And this is very fast paced iteration. So very quickly, you can go and prototype out a UI and connect it to Shotgun and uh, kind of build it out piece by piece without having to restart Maya. Uh, having done that, we have our last method, uh, create ticket, which uh, creates a new ticket uh, entity in Shotgun. Basically, from it just grabs all that stuff in the dialog. And uh, we're going to be using the Python API here again. So we have the create method. Uh, and we are going to grab stuff like the title, the description, uh, addressing CC, that's uh, the CC value we're grabbing from the widget. And uh, for the project, so most entities in Shotgun will require a project, we can use the Toolkit context. So Toolkit keeps track of what you're working on. It knows the current task, current shot, the current project. And you can quickly just using uh, the context to, to essentially pull in the, the project and use that to populate uh, any data when you when you put that back into Shotgun. And that could be tasks, that could be shots. Uh, if you create something, you have access to this context, which could have just you can plug back into Shotgun, which can be really useful. And again, something that Toolkit will handle for you that you otherwise would need to manage yourself. If there is a, a screenshot, uh, we then grab that ticket that we just created, and we upload uh, the screenshot as an attachment to the ticket. And then eventually, we just present a, a little message box with information to say it's done. And now that we have built our app, uh, we can add it not just to Maya, 
but this will uh, work in Nuke, Houdini, uh, and a bunch of other DCCs. And we can also run it directly from Shotgun Desktop or even from uh, Shotgun, uh, the web app. So you can right click on the shop and report a bug straight from there. It's all uh, uh, working across all these environments. So uh, job done. Now we wanna deploy our bug tracking tool to production. Uh, so uh, we wanna basically push that configuration change that we've made locally out to production. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're gonna be using GitHub for this. So uh, we're gonna create a release in GitHub. We're gonna update our dev sandbox to point to uh, this released version that we created. And then we're gonna take that dev configuration and we're gonna deploy that as our production configuration to Shotgun. And uh, so I have created in GitHub a brand new repo, TK multi bug reporter. And I put all my code there. It's great. We highly recommend putting all this stuff in source control. That's really good practice. And uh, I have then gone in and created a 1.0.0 release in GitHub. And now I have this in a place which is uh, in the cloud, on the internet, people can access it. And I'm gonna go in, jump to my development configuration and go back into that uh, Maya file where I had my uh, definition my, where I added the uh, bug reporter before, and I'm gonna go and switch out this location. Instead of being dev and pointing to my local drive, I can now point it to the cloud. So I can point this to a GitHub release. Uh, and I just put the version number, uh, the repository in, and this means that uh, all users can access this location. Uh, so now I have a config that doesn't have any points, any, any parts that point to my local disk. I can now go ahead and deploy this. I'm gonna basically zip up my config. I have a little zip file and I'm going to my project in Shotgun and I go to the pipeline configurations. And we can see here, the pipeline configurations, we have two entries. So we have the primary entry at the bottom and this is the production configuration. This is what everyone is using. And then I have my dev, which you can see is restricted to be just me and that points to my local drive on, on my local disk. And now I wanna update this 1.2.7 configuration with my latest change. So let's upload my zip file and that will essentially deploy it to everyone else. Uh, I'm gonna rename it to be 1.2.7.1 rather than archive.zip so we can see where it came from. It was based on 1.2.7 and uh, I am uploading 1.2.7.1. Now it's been uploaded. Anyone who starts up Shotgun Desktop or Maya will get this new updated config instead of the previous one. And uh, as they are downloading this new config, they will also grab that release out of GitHub at the same time, and it will be cached locally on their machine, and they will have it appear in Maya. And if using GitHub and a public release like this isn't something that is uh, uh, suitable. Uh, you know, most of the time you might not want to publicly uh, publish all of your work. We have a number of different ways that you can essentially create these locations that I was showing before. And we call it descriptors. There is an extensive API around this and there is multiple ways to, to kind of handle that deployment situation. Uh, in fact, if you're really interested, you know, come and talk to us in the forums. Uh, we also did uh, a paper last year at SIGGRAPH where we presented all uh, a number of different workflows uh, around deployment uh, in the cloud. So that uh, concludes my portion of the talk. Uh, we built this app, or I, I showed some, some, some steps how to build this app in under 30 minutes. Uh, it's really easy to build these apps and deploy them across software. Once you have it in one place, uh, the toolkit platform allows you to essentially distribute it across. You can both, both in the web app, in Shotgun, uh, in Shotgun Desktop, Shotgun Create, uh, as well as uh, all the different uh, environments that we support. And uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, frameworks for widgets and reusable code that makes it quick to 
be up and running. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to implement uh, a bunch of this sort of boilerplate shotgun data management. A lot of that stuff is already in there and can be picked up. Uh, there is this sort of quick reload iteration cycle that makes it quick to, to sort of develop and flesh out a UI and build it out step by step. Uh, and it's easy to deploy these changes back to shotgun and to production. If you're interested in learning more about this, uh, uh, there is the developer site, uh, developer.shotgunsoftware.com, uh, which is a good resource. This will lead you to all the different documentation, API references, including tutorials, guides, and kind of knowledge base stuff. We also have a community site, uh, which uh, was launched uh, just about a month ago, and we've already had a lot of activity. It's uh, it's uh, a great place to go and ask questions and discuss things and uh, where there's a ton of knowledge. Our community uh, has been building these apps, apps for a long time. So people are very, very happy to jump in and answer. And so are we, community.shotgunsoftware.com. Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, any questions? And again, the GitHub link in case you guys wanna take a look at the code and download it, uh, including this presentation. There are a couple questions in the chat that came up. Uh, one was, does the SH file to build resources work on Windows as well? It does not. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there may, uh, there has been some people who have created a, a Windows version of that. I think it might work if you have like a, a, a Windows, uh, like a bash uh, for Windows but it's, it doesn't work straight out of the command, command line, uh, like Windows command shell. And then does the reload and restart work on Python 3? Which if you wanna make that a bigger question about Python 3, Manning by all means. Yes, so uh, yes, uh, um, Python 3, uh, as I'm sure you are aware, is, uh, is coming. We are working on uh, porting all of this platform to Python 3 right now. We have uh, ported and released the Shotgun Python API, uh, and that was announced at SIGGRAPH uh, a little bit over a month ago, uh, and we are in progress of porting everything else. So uh, this is a work in progress, and so uh, it, all of these things will work, the reload and restart, once, once we have finished this porting exercise. Awesome. All right, are there any other questions about either Brandon or Manny's presentations? Doesn't look like it. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with us today, this morning for me, whatever part time of the day it is for all of you. Um, we will, I, we are recording this and we'll upload it to YouTube and report back with that URL um, once we have it on the Shotgun Dev mailing list, as well as uh, there's a community post about these webinars, so you can check there, community.shotgunsoftware.com. I'll mention yet again. Um, and that's it. We'll keep you posted when we have new webinars coming up. And we hope to see you there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.